Good afternoon. This talk is uh, using and scaling Python. Um, I apologize for a lack of reverence, but over the last 11 years in putting BlueGene on supercomputers, um, a lot of reverence has left me. The first week I was uh, at the LCF, I had a conversation with a very senior performance engineer who will go unnamed, but in a heavy Russian accent, imagine him saying, people are doing high performance computing with Python, how do we stop them? And having come from a Perl background originally, Python seemed to be a world of fixes and stability. Um, and so why not enable them? And so part of the reason for this talk is, well, frankly, Python's popular. It's a lot more popular than it was even a few years ago. Um, it's come up on top of CodeVal's rankings. It's at the top of IEEE Spectrum's rankings. It's become basically the de facto language for data science. Take that, Julia. Um, it's used for a large number of scientific workflow so software. I can't think of a piece of scientific workflow software that does not either written in Python or have Python bindings. Uh, the first large Python for HPC project I was involved with was a package called GPA. If Nick Ramirez is in the room, he's still probably suffering from it. And GPA started off basically with, let's prototype this density functional theory software in Python. And it turns out, well, they spent most of their time in DGEM, so it kind of persisted with it as a Python wrapper around DGEM. So people implement production software in, in Python. And finally, kind of the real reason of this talk is we kind of see this, a lot of the same practices and mistakes that impact user codes. Um, one of the things that's nice about Python is life is easy. Part of the, the problem with Python is life is easy, and so it's easy to find yourself um, very conveniently conda and updating yourself um, into a hole in the ground. So for the, is there anyone here who has not used Python? There's always one, okay. Okay, uh, thank you. So why Python? Because if there's a programming paradigm you like, it's already supported. Imperative, sure. Object-oriented, great. Designed by contract, why not? Um, if you're a C or, uh, C or C++ program, most things map back to what you already know. It's really easy to combine with other languages. Uh, for the first time this last week, I wound up interfacing Python and Rust, um, ironically to get MPI into Rust. Um, it's easy to keep your code readable and maintainable if you've never heard of PEP8. Um, PEP8 is kind of like having a significant other that rearranges your sock drawer and then viciously wants you to keep everything exactly where it says. As, uh, historically, if you wrote code to PEP8, you could almost guarantee that it would continue to run um, on into the future. You can do just about anything without changing languages. Um, as just kind of a sideshow at one point, I, we had, I had worked with a group that was pulling things directly off of embedded devices in Python, streaming them onto a supercomputer in Python. Uh, ALCF's job schedule, Cobalt, is written in Python. So basically, we had Python end to end to end. Um, the price is right. There's no license management. Famously, John Hunter, the guy who wrote Matplotlib, started Matplotlib basically because the uh, license server at the University of Chicago kept crashing. And so he thought it was faster to write his own graphing library than to get the Matplot license server fixed. Um, Cord paratability, I can use basically the same Python um, on x86 as I do on Power9, as I do on ARM. Um, I can pack up a Flask web server and drop it in everything from an embedded box um, up to one of the largest machines in the world. Everything, just about everything is fully open source. Um, you can get the code, you can see what's going on in deep inside, or gratefully you can remain ignorant of it at all. For folks who do like commercial support uh, options, if Clive Moeller were in the room, he'd be throwing something at me right now. Um, you can get commercial support um, at home institutions from companies like, well, I guess Continuum is now officially Anaconda Inc. But there's also InThought, there's ActiveState. Um, I'm pretty sure Intel will even probably sell you some form of support. And finally, there's a very enthusiastic and very helpful community. Um, if you've never seen the Chicago Python users group for folks who are local, it's basically like suddenly discovering you've got 550 very opinionated friends. Um, why wouldn't I use Python? Well, it turns out that performance is a secondary concern for a lot of developers and, and distributions. Um, a lot of the folks who are developing Python modules and libraries aren't in HPC environments. 
a lot of the vast majority are in laptops, desktops, or working in server environments. A lot of the tools, uh, very few of them are scientists, though that's been on the rise. Uh, a lot of the tools are designed to work best and well, say, as generic environments. That is to say, uh, your x86-64 laptop running a fairly reasonably recent distribution of Linux or Windows. Um, that means that if you try to go to build something like Python uh, and cross-compilation for the blue gene, uh, you get a lot of really strange theories from Python dev. Uh, language maintainers favor consistency over compatibility. That is to say, uh, part of the Zen of Python is there is one way to do things. So occasionally, if they find a second way of doing things, it'll disappear out of the core of the language. Um, for, is there anyone here who's had to take a code from Python 2 to Python 3? Okay, so that's kind of the start of it. Um, even moving from Python 2.5 to 2.6 to 2.7, um, there were lots of little breakages in the language, things that you could get back by importing another module, um, but really the goal was to get the language to be highly, highly consistent. Finally, there's a, back, there's a low learning curve. Uh, this means it's very easy to throw together, you know, 20,000, 30,000 lines of code and then go, what have I done? Um, I do this fairly frequently. And then the final thing, and we're going to kind of speak to this in a little bit, is it's very easy to develop code that works but won't scale. Um, to settle one of the elephants in the room, on the, question, the great question that I keep getting uh, is uh, Python, 2, Python 3. This used to be a matter of debate even six months ago. The answer is now just use Python 3. Um, it's, the, it's here, it's stable. All the major libraries work well under Python 3, 5, and later. Um, keenly, matplotlib, no, the latest version of matplotlib no, no longer even supports uh, Python 2. Um, increasingly, it sounds like NumPy is going to go the way of no longer supporting Python 2. Uh, it's basically, if you've put off moving, your, moving from Python 2 to Python 3, um, this is a really good time to be doing it. Um, all the major popular tools work with Python 3.5, so if you're using any sort of IDE, um, they basically now are guaranteed to work with Python 3.5 and later. Intel's VTune works very nicely with Python 3. Um, even Tau and the like work very nicely with Python 3. Um, one of the important things to think about is that Python 3's loaders and most of its inter internals now are written in Python. That was done to kind of get closer and closer and closer to a self-hosting Python. This means that there are some compromises for people in HPC spaces because um, file I.O. does kill us, and the more small files you have in a file system, like say a Python interpreter written in, with most of its pieces in Python, um, then you do begin to see slowdowns and overheads, but there are ways around that. Um, and the final real reason for moving to Python 3 at long last is Python 2 development is effectively stopped. There will be no Python 2.8. Um, they've declared declare that from the hills. Basically, what we'll be seeing from here on out is security and bug fixes. No new features, no more backporting. Um, they would, everyone would like to go on to making uh, Python 3.7 and Python 3.8 the best things ever. So, one of the things to think about is that Python at ALCF is every system we run is a cross-compile environment except for Cooley. And one of the things right off the bat that tends to hit people is that almost nothing in the Python universe was developed for cross-compiling. This means pip, distu tools, setup tools, and anaconda really aren't meant for having one architecture on the login and another architecture for computes. We can kind of get away and abuse this in the x86 case because x86 is x86, but it does mean that generally when you're using things, uh, pre-compiled wheels, pre-compiled packages, they, for the sake of compatibility, they are aimed at the lowest possible common denominator. Um, even if you're using like Intel's TensorFlow wheels, they are built in such a manner that they target, I believe, Ivy Bridge at, at the base and then Sandy Bridge at the high end as, their tar as the compiler flag targets. Um, that isn't to say they don't support AVX 512 because most of that they do through MKL. But if you're using other modules, you'll, you can easily get yourself burned. We'll kind of come back to that. Um, the Blue Gene Q Python, for folks who are absolutely uh, trying to, to get the last legs out of Mira, 
Um, it's manually maintained. There's some instructions on use in soft Cobalt examples Python. Um, I will build modules on request for folks if they absolutely need them, but think very, very carefully uh, before making such a request uh, because as the BGQ is at end of life. Um, the XA664 platform offers us a lot more options, and I'll kind of come into this in a minute. Um, there is Miniconda, which is maintained by members of Data Science Group. There is an Intel Python, which is ba based off of Conda. Um, there is ALCF Python, which we build and manage using SPAC. Um, the SPAC Turing squad is off to my side, um, which is uh, loadable via modules and an update for it's coming soon. Or if you, you're really, you, you've built Python into a larger framework, you can even bring your own Python, usually without too much pain. Um, we do, there's a, and this is more of a personal opinion than a, a royal we, um, it, it's useful if people install their own environments, that is to say the use tools as designed. If you're using Conda or the like, create environments, because otherwise what will wind up happening is it becomes very easy for parts and versions to shift underneath you and kind of shoot you in the foot. Um, at the same time, using tools like Conda make it very easy to shoot yourself in the foot. And we'll kind of come back to that in a minute. Um, and I will also harp on the need to uh, set up the environment to use uh, Cray and Pitch. So if you're using important things like MPI for Pi, HDF5 for Pi, uh, well, H5Pi and the like, you, with MPI bindings, you will absolutely positively want to make sure at the end of the night that you are using Cray and Pitch. Otherwise, what will wind up happening is you'll go to launch on 4,000 nodes and you'll get 4,000 one-ranked jobs all trying to write to the same files at the same time, uh, possibly just absolutely destroying your inputs and giving you outputs that might possibly be right, but more often than not are just a giant pile of confusion and sadness. So to kind of run really quickly through uh, the options, uh, again, Theta has a Minicond install. Um, just as a point of syntax, where you see that uh, two redirect to ampersand one, uh, modules outputs everything to standard error. I'm sure somebody thought this was a great idea in uh, 1992. Um, so if you would like to grep through modules lists or take things apart, you need to redirect standard error to standard out. Um, so there's different uh, modules for the login, and there's one that uh, I believe Taylor maintains. Hi, Taylor. Um, with uh, a Cray and Pitch appropriate libraries and bindings uh, with H5 with H5Pi and uh, MPI for Pi. Uh, there's also an Intel Python that's installed. You can use it via Conda, except for it's a little bit dated at this point. Um, and again, you're free to bring your own installation of Anaconda uh, if you would like. Um, to speak for a minute about ALCF Python, um, it's built from source via a tool called SPAC. Um, if there's anybody else here who suffered through anything ECP related, we all are suffering through SPAC. Um, but that it's a meta module that's loading NumPy and SciPy, H5Py and MPI for Py um, with basically everything tuned as best, it built with the Intel compilers and tuned as best possible uh, for the KNL, while allowing for a certain level of compromise, uh, so things will still work on uh, the mom nodes. Um, if you're using the ALC of Python, um, I would it, at the very least look into using a tool like VirtualEnv, um, just again to keep your environment straight. Uh, if you have already started a workflow using Conda, I recommend you know continuing your life in Conda. If you're using virtual env, use virtual env, but do not mix the two. Um, they have, they look very, very similar internally, or they have very, very different life philosophies as to how um, an environment should be managed, and you'll wind up with, again, kind of a giant mess. Um, finally, if there's things that are not in an ALCF Python build um, that folks would like to see, if there's a spec spec, we'll gla uh, gladly give it a build and install it um, into ALCF Python. So now that we've kind of talked about mechanics and all the different options, it's kind of like walking into a supermarket after coming out of a desert. 
you've got all the Python, and these various versions. And the, one of the quick questions, because I know I'm going to get it towards the end, is, well, which one is right for me? And really the answer comes back to, what are you comfortable with? What are your applications and what are your goals? Um, feel free to approach me or any other member of the staff uh, and discuss that. Um, some folks, portability is important, so Conda makes sense. Some folks are out for the best possible performance they can get, and so having a universe built completely from source for a particular machine makes sense. Uh, again, it really comes down to your goals. Question is, if we write an application, where do we want to spend our time? And for Python, it's just as true as anything else. Um, we want to spend our time in vector instructions. AVX 512 is gorgeous, it's beautiful, um, and we would like to make the most use of it we can. The next kind of area where we'd like to spend our time is in some form of threading, making use of all the cores on, on a node after we've made sure that, while we're using all these vector units. And you can get there through MPI, OpenMP, um, it's harassing these parts, OpenACC, your threads. Then you kind of hope that the next kind of layer down is MPI. If you're spending all of your time in communication, you've got a problem. And then you're hoping that the least amount of your time is spent in things like job submission and managing workflows, tying programs and pieces together. So off the bat, CPython is not particularly friendly in, in, the, in this kind of inverted pyramid scheme or inverted pyramid way of looking at the world. When you take a, there's a, a module in Python called dis or DIS, it's the disassembler. And uh, internally, Pyth you can put functions and things into the disassembler and it'll show you how Python's internal stack-based machine is going to take your Python code, take it apart and execute it um, as, as machine instructions. And so we have just a really simple calculation of pi there's a lot of instructions there. We've got a bunch of loads. Um, we've got, hey, we're basically running through. But the one thing that if we were doing this in C or C++, almost all of this would basically be collapsed into maybe half of that at, at, the, very, very, at the very, very least. Um, there's no look ahead. There's no optimization. There's no folding. There's no magic um, fuse multiply add or power instruction there. It's almost like we've thrown back to the MIPS uh, where we didn't even have a divide. Even if we're trying to do something uh, clever and say something that a C or C++ compile would vectorize, instead we get basically a series of absolutely sequential instructions. Not particularly pretty, not particularly efficient. So, of course, there's got to be a better way. And, you know, so there was this idea of list comprehensions in Python where, you know, we can put everything in one line. The Python interpreter can only see one line at a time, so if we put it all in one line, life will be great, right? No, not really. Again, we don't really have any sort of vectorization there. We're very clearly not going to really get any additional performance, pri performance out. Um, in short, the default C Python interpreter is not where you should be doing your numerics. Um, you're going to get something large, bloated, and highly, highly sequential at the end of the night. To kind of make matters worth, even if the Python interpreter wanted to do many, many, many things at once, um, had some sort of reduction operator, um, there's this wonderful thing that is still present in Python 3 called the GLIL, or Global Interpreter Lock. And the Global Interpreter Lock basically allows the Python interpreter to have all the threads at once. Uh, they're true threads, they're P threads. Don't let anybody dissuade you of that fact. The truth is all these Python threads can only one at a time can work in the interpreter's memory space. So this is basically meant that historically if you've won performance, you have to work outside of the interpreter's memory space and compiled modules, uh, things written in Cython, uh, C, C++, or Fortran. Um, I, I will defend the gill for a moment and say, it's already turned off for I.O. tasks, so if you're doing anything with sockets or file I.O., it's basically sidestepped. Um, it makes writing C modules a heck of a lot easier than uh, doing so in other languages. It makes me maintain the interpreter easy, and frankly, for HPC folks, the guild basically doesn't matter, because again, hopefully we're doing things often 
um, external libraries or doing things through offload or in MPI such that all of our interpreters can, can take a part uh, and do their work separately without having to wait for a gill. Um, kind of a final takeaway is CPython is a REPL loop, read, eval, print, and go. There's no look ahead, there's no automatic parallelism. Everything is piecewise and sequential. Again, I think I've beaten that one to death, but it's important to think about. Um, people have stopped and think, um, Russell Powered and Alex Rubenstein had a really great paper, How Fast Can We Make Interpreted Python? And my favorite piece about it, so Python doesn't have uh, types, in, in static typing. It's all dynamic typing, and as a result, in the general absence of type information, almost every instruction can be treated as invoke arbitrary method. And that means to make something safe, basically you can't really predict, you really can't look ahead. You have to stop and treat the data as it is in the moment. So now that I've completely saddened everyone in the room, I think there's a couple of people in the back who look like I killed their puppy. Um, how do we get around a lot of this? And it comes down to NumPy and SciPy. Uh, really kind of your first, which really should kind of be your first stop for performance improvement. Um, if you're doing your numerics in anything other than NumPy or SciPy, and I'll put a little asterisk that will not be in this talk, but probably the next version of this talk, uh, or with Numba, um, you're basically going to, uh, going to have trouble. Um, but it provides us in-dimensional homogeneous arrays. It provides us broadcasting universal functions and ways to write and create new universal functions. There's built-in linear algebra routines, FFTs, uh, pseudo-random number generators, easy tools for integrating with other languages. And again, you basically are handing off all the heavy lifting to something like MKL or IBM's SL uh, to your BLOS or LAPAC. Um, there's also a, a couple additional, additional kind of, I guess you could say, overarching uh, group of routines put together in a package called SciPy, which contains optimization, additional linear algebra routines, integration, interpolation, yet more FFTs, some signal and image processing, and ordina ordinary differential equation solvers. To SciPy generally looks at NumPy's configs to figure out what's going on. And so we, in fact, a lot of packages, even TensorFlow, look at, back at NumPy's configs to figure out what's going on. So the worst thing you can have happen in this world is to have a bad build of NumPy. Um, it's kind of hard to read from the back, but um, I've got two side by, a side-by-side -side comparison with a relatively naive build of uh, NumPy uh, built with MKL via SPAC, and then just one where I did pip install NumPy. And so, you know, build out a, a matrix of uh, 100 by 100 random uh, random floats, multiply it by a vector of 100 floats, do it a couple hundred times and come back to me with how long it took. Essentially, we've knocked, we've almost reduced the, the runtime fivefold by just linking MKL. We haven't done anything smart or clever. All that is is we've linked MKL just naively and we've had, had a five, almost a 5x improvement. So, to kind of drive it one step further, why not do some of my numerics by hand? So I have a matrix multiply routine that I wrote. Um, it takes in two, uh, two, uh, two matrices, 100 by 100, multiplies them. Did it manually the way I would do if I were a C or Fortran programmer, except for if I were doing this in C or Fortran, I'd be doing it in a much nicer way. Um, versus doing it with NumPy, there the return is a 400 time return on my investment by just pulling out my manual, my manual code and putting in the, the right routines out of NumPy. It, so again, takeaway, please don't do it in C Python itself. Please, 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 if you can at all do it um, in compiled code through NumPy or SciPy, do it. So this kind of brings us kind of to the start of a couple of questions about parallelism. We have all these cores, how do we make use of them? And one of the things that we seem to find is people crossing the streams. That is to say, folks will accidentally mix two um, OpenMP runtimes, they'll mix OpenMP plus threads. Oh, for the love of God, they'll break out multiprocessing, and so they'll have multiprocessing inside of a job using MPI, and then in addition to multiprocessing, 
they'll be using OpenMP, and they get really stumped as to why they're seg faulting. Um, and the tracebacks are very, very hard to read. Essentially, inside of, inside of multiprocessing and inside of a lot of the, what you would think of as single processor or um, desktop approaches to Python parallelism, such as multiprocessing, you wind up with certain aspects of threads, like in thread local storage and certain um, pieces, say, of MPI being shared in common across those forked processes or containing duplicate data structures. And so it begins to be, become really, really painful. Likewise, if, if you've got a bad build of something like MK, uh, a bad build of something uh, like NumPy or TensorFlow where you might have more than one OpenMP runtime, it becomes very, very hard to control. Um, I had worked with someone fairly recently who, as we kind of dug into what was happening and why their code was so slow in KNL, it turns out they had managed to link three separate OpenMP runtimes nested and had wound up with close to 10,000 threads on one node. Um, cleaning up the build was sufficient to get it down to one OpenMP runtime, and it brought them down to about the predicted number of threads. Um, this brings back one important thing, which is when things don't look right, when something like the KNL runs slower than a laptop or slower than the iMac that you had in grad school, it's usually um, a good, the first place that I actually tend to look is at people at affinity settings on the Cray. Um, under the heading of heresy, sometimes setting CC none as opposed to CC depth and allowing, things, allowing MKL to manage your affinity or allowing your OpenMP runtime to manage the affinity will put you out ahead. Um, alternately, dropping down to, turning off op OpenMP and setting down the number of threads to one and trying to raise your number of, raising your number of MPI ranks, if that seems to also help things, it's a pretty good sign that there's an affinity problem or a build problem, um, particularly in your threading. So about once or, about once a month right now, um, we face a, we'll get a, a question in about using something like Dask. Um, on our machines. And my answer always comes back, why not try using MPI first? Um, basically, it's going to probably be, for the rest of time, the paradigm for interprocess communication on supercomputers. It's supported by every HPC center on the planet. It doesn't matter if you're here or Oak Ridge or on the departmental cluster. Um, MPI is guaranteed to be there. The APIs are stable, standardized, and they're portable. Uh, sorry, C++ folks. Um, and again, it, it'll continue to be around. The important thing that you really kind of get out of MPI is that your vendor MPIs are built by people who know the machine. They leverage the interconnects and the hardware in a way that other things can't. When you look at things like uh, Dask, Spark, Hadoop, and protocol buffers, unless you're using something like Horvod, which slides in MPI underneath, what you're really winding up with is uh, socket traffic. So you're going over an emulation of TCP IP over the emulation of a socket over this beautiful fancy interconnect. Or worse, if you're using Hadoop, um, you're using your file system as the interconnect, which is, by the way, if you don't run here and you want to drive your file systems administrator crazy, um, a couple terabytes of Hadoop uh, benchmarking is a w wonderful way to do it. The, you can, Again, almost guarantee that the MP, that MPI will be your best bet for sharing and communicating between nodes wherever you go. The tools work that work well for MPI in general tend to work well these days for Python. Um, the debuggers the debuggers even seem to work. Um, though still, I think the best supported uh, Python plus MPI debugger remains Visual Studio 2008. Um, just because it had a really nice display and actually could keep track of hundreds of processes. Um, but for the most part, TotalView, um, DDT, all seem to be able to handle Python relatively nicely these days. Uh, and finally, Python plus MPI is not a new thing. Um, people have been doing this since at least 1996. Uh, David Beasley, if I go through the literature, seems to be, have had the first which where he had implemented just one MPI function call with a Python wrapper, again, similar to the guy who wrote Matplotlib, John Hunter. 
he did it because he needed the one function to write his dissertation. Um, for the most part, though, we've standardized on a package called MPI for Pi, managed by Lissandra Dawson. It's stable, it's well supported. It, again, matches what the uh, MPI to C++ bindings uh, look like. So if there should ever be resurrection of object-oriented MPI, um, it'll be probably pretty close. The downside to MPI and all these things, again, remains uh, the bottleneck at startup. Um, you can wind up with uh, some absolutely beautiful catastrophic loading. This graph comes off of Mira, where the more MPI ranks you have, the longer it takes to load uh, NumPy. There, have been, there are workarounds. Um, Cray has built in things like DVS, which helps kind of soften the blow of a lot of that. Um, there have been a couple packages that we had had on the Bluejean P that were meant to do broadcasting loads. But it's one of the important things to think about. If, even if something is running really well on your laptop or on a workstation, um, as your scale, you may need to put in an additional five to ten minutes to make sure that everything comes up. So it may not just it may not be that your code is slow or the machine is slow. It's just that it's going to take it may take it longer to get to begin execution. Um, to kind of turn it back to MPI for Pi. Um, for the most part, everything that you, your system MPI does, MPI for Pi will do. It, it's a, it just meant to be a Pythonic wrapper around your MPI features. So if you're on a machine with partial support for MPI 3, well, MPI for Pi will not fix that. It will just give you partial support for MPI 3. Um, again, it's very well maintained. There's builds with Conda, um, Nthots Canopy. Again, very, very, very well done. The number of dependencies are relatively small with just NumPy, Cython, and your uh, system MPI. And again, we've, with GPA and others, we've managed to scale it up to the full size of Mirror and actually do some really uh, wonderful production science. Uh, starting MPI for Pi is just like starting any other MPI binary. Um, you can swap out MPI exec uh, there for AP run or any other command uh, that may be local to your system. Um, I always recommend uh, targeting your full path to the Python that you think you're running. Uh, so that way, if you have something set up like a uh, condo environment or uh, virtual env, you're getting the Python that you're expecting. And then just the path of the script that you'd like to run. Uh, with MPI for Pi, you get an independent Python interpreter per rank. So again, no gil. Um, this does mean, though, that there's no automatic shared memory, files, or state. It's purely just like in any other MPI program, what you're passing back and forth. Um, one important thing to think about is um, it doesn't give you any additional magic fault tolerance. It's not like you can trap the exception and walk through the traceback. So if you crash an MPI, you've crashed. Um, there's a very wise man named Jed Brown, one of the Petsy maintainers, who shared with me the wisdom of duplicating communicators before you pass them in and out of uh, something like Petsy's Python bindings, or in fact anything uh, where you don't control or maintain the library. Um, it makes it a lot easier to debug M MPI programs when you're um, duplicating communicators and keeping, I guess you could say, uh, sanitize, keeping them sanitized. Um, it's also conversely possible to, to embed Python within a C or C++ uh, application and launch things that way. As long as the application that you're embedding into is using the same MPI as MPI for Pi, um, everything will just work. Uh, so for those times when it doesn't just work, again, it's a binding. Um, when it crashes, you're going to wind up with a lot of core files and mangle stack traces. Uh, my general recommendation before even turning back to those uh, bindings and stack traces is actually to make sure um, using LD or OTOL on the Mac to make sure that MPI for Pi is actually linked correctly um, and that you're using the MPI that you think you're using because that seems to be the start of a lot of problems. Um, it's also if you're using things like HDF5 to make sure that those are also still using the same MPI and that you haven't accidentally mixed, say, part of Open MPI with MPitch or the Intel MPI or the Cray MPI. Um, one kind of brute force thing if you're using uh, Anaconda and you're operating an environment is Conda will carry by default a copy of MPitch 
uh, with it when you install MPI for Pi. And there's a wonderful query document that um, I'd mentioned earlier, and I think it comes up again uh, within this presentation. But sometimes the best answer is actually just literally to copy the Cray MPI uh, libraries and clobber the ones inside of your uh, Conda environment. Um, that seems to work 99% of the time uh, for fixing MPI issues. Um, barring that, trying to run with a single rank, making sure things work with N1 uh, is usually a pretty good start. And barring all of that, um, if you have to go digging through core files, making sure everything was built with debugging symbols. Because we're kind of short on, and quick on time, um, I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of MPI uh, for Pi. It's basically everything lines up with about what you would expect uh, from uh, any other MPI, MPI interface. It's just basically that MPI net is uh, called almost by default, but you can call it manually if you want to do something like spread, uh, force the use to thread multiple or funneled or single. Um, MPI finalize, again, is automatically called at exit. So there's no need to do that unless you have a reason for shutting things down. Otherwise, the code that, you, the code that you're running will run on all ranks um, without an issue. So in this case, uh, we'll get a hello from an even rank from anything whose rank ID, rank number is uh, div evenly div divisible by uh, two. Everyone will stop, and then we'll get a goodbye from all ranks, not just the even ones. One really kind of important thing about using MPI for Pi is data types. Um, you will want to make sure that everything, the easiest way to think about it is make sure that your data types and what you're putting over the wire conform to a C data type um, or can be represented as a memory buffer. Um, otherwise, it'll t MPI for Pi will very handily but very slowly uh, take your py convenient Python objects, pickle, uh, pickle them, that is to say serialize them and turn them into a long text string and put those over the wire. Um, you can't pickle everything as well. You can't pickle anything that contains like a file handler or pointers or sockets. Um, but luckily, again, it'll give you a trace back and those are actually handleable. Um, for the most part, when you're choosing, you'll notice if you're using MPI for Pi, there's an uppercase and a lowercase uh, ver version of everything. Um, the mental trick to me is always go big or go home because the capital the capitalized ones are the ones that are using C type, using MPI data types or uh, C data types or buffers. So there's no pickling, there's no serialization. You're going to get pretty close to wire speed. Um, if you are kind of questioning as to, well, can this be put over the wire without pickling? The answer basically comes down to can it be represented as a memory buffer? Or if I point type uh, the uh, put ty point type at it, would it come back ultimately as pi object? Um, again, collectives are kind of interesting because if you use them on pi objects or any sort of Python type, um, you'll get kind of a naive action. So if you do say reduce with uh, sum, with uh, say Python strings, rather than trying to line them up and add them up. Um, instead, you'll get string concatenation. If you have some really complex object, like say something uh, representing oh, a particle, um, it will basically act with whatever the Python method for that particle object is uh, and use the sum. If you are using something that is an MPI data type or, or a C buffer, it will do what is appropriate for and do what is appropriate in those cases. Um, very few very few small surprises there. So again, lowercase methods, Python objects slow, uppercase objects, NumPy, MPI data types at C speed. Um, parallel I.O. is fully supported. HDF5 at this point uh, has a, a binding, Python bindings as H5Py, things just tend to work. Um, parallel I.O. is supported as, again, a first-class citizen, but it's important to make sure that everything is built with the MPI and the HDF5 libraries that you expect. Um, if you're using the Miniconda build or the ALCF Python, there's no worry about that. 
um, things have kind of been taken care of for, for you and properly linked. In terms of profiling, um, I'm not going to spend much time on this because we're basically out of time, but uh, it's important to kind of to look at, uh, look at where your goals are. Uh, VTune has actually been really, really valuable in this regard, um, and it's Python in the, at, Python support is ongoing and continuing to improve and improve and improve. But the nice thing about it for people developing HPC codes is you can handle uh, mixing C, C++, Fortran, and uh, Python all in one language. The, over, the, the overhead is relatively low. This is versus using something like C profile, uh, C profile or line profile that will tell you where you are within the Python program but may not be able to give you any insight into what's happening when you hand off the NumPy or you're handing off um, into a custom library. Um, there's a few slides here blatantly stolen from a colleague at Intel um, for using Python with uh, VTune. Uh, walk, and kind of walking through the view. And since we're kind of at time, I'm going to kind of shoot to, if I had to reduce this entire talk to one slide. So the first thing I always tell people is benchmark and profile as you're developing. Make sure that um, you're not going forward. Uh, well, you're not going backwards. Uh, control your environment. That is to say, make sure that you are linking and loading what you're thinking you're linking and loading. Um, always use NumPy, NumPy or SciPy if you can. Watch your data types. Don't mix fork and threading. Do not use multiprocessing. Please, I beg you, do not use multiprocessing and uh, production codes. Um, you, if you have to use threading, do it in compiled modules. Watch affinity. Watch your startup times carefully. Um, Nine times out of ten, people in the Python community have already solved a problem for you, so if someone else already has a module or a solution, uh, go after it. And uh, the final kind of detail is on the Cray. Make sure you put in the dash B flag when you're doing AP run, uh, because other, when you're using something like Conda or, uh, well, in, in virtual env, because otherwise, by default, to speed up loading times, uh, the Cray will move whatever the binary is off to another location. And so in the case of Conda, um, it does relative linking. So if your Python interpreter moves, suddenly it doesn't know where any of its libraries are and you get crashes. Or worse yet, you wind up with random, uh, randomly linked dependencies. Um, there's a much longer tutorial that was put on by myself, Matt Bellhorn, and Roland Thomas as part of the Xscale Compute Program. Uh, they high, highly encourage people to check out. And uh, the Intel Python distribution for a while had some pretty uh, good Im information um, about getting started with it. I'm over time, but do we have any questions? The question is, it looks like there's only a 2.7 available for the ALCF Python. That is right. Um, there was a bug in the Intel compiler that kept us from being able to build uh, three, but that's been fixed, and so there should be one any day now uh, for 3.7.0. Um, any other questions, comments? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>